Video 18 for Artificial Intelligence. Um, I'm going to continue now talking about supervised learning. Um, and the initial thing that I want to convince you of is that supervised learning is basically just curve fitting. If, for example, you did A-levels and you ever did an experiment where you plotted a bunch of points that you'd obtained experimentally, and then you drew a line uh, through the points, and then inferred something, for instance, by estimating the gradient and the intercept for your line, then essentially you were doing supervised learning in one dimension. And that's actually quite a useful place to start because it immediately allows um, me to give you a very simple example of how this might work and what the pitfalls might be. So the trick here is to think of machine learning in terms of an adversary. In this case, nature. And nature picks a function from a hypothesis space. But it doesn't tell you what it is. You only get to see information about this function by seeing specific points on it. Those points correspond to a training set. So here I'm actually giving an example where there is only one feature. And that feature is real valued. And that's simply because uh, it makes it really easy to draw. But in any case, nature only shows you a training sequence. And it makes that training sequence by picking some points, some individual features, and then finding the value of the function that nature has chosen, but which it is not revealing to you. And to that value, it adds some noise, epsilon. So the training sequence that nature gives you as evidence for what this hidden function h prime might look like is itself imperfect because it's had some noise added to it. Now this is a perfectly reasonable assumption to be used in practice because when you measure things and you measure their label, you will generally not end up labeling examples in any kind of perfect manner. For example, even in medical diagnosis, where that label is a class, has disease or doesn't have disease, even an expert will sometimes get their diagnosis wrong. Here I'm not using a binary classification. As for medical diagnosis, I'm using regression because that's easier to draw. So the output of my classifier is actually a real number. Uh, and in this case, we might, for example, model this noise as being uh, Gaussian, um, and this might be appropriate, for example, if you're trying to predict temperature pressure or, or anything that's more appropriately measured using a real number. But the key underlying idea here is that there is a function, we don't know it, this is h prime. We want to identify it, but we're only getting partial information because there are a finite number of function arguments, xi, and for each of those, we're given something that is close to the value of h prime, but corrupted by some noise. So what I've done here is to generate um, a sequence in precisely this manner. And the noise I've added has a quite, a quite a good variance to it. So some of the information we're getting about h prime is pretty wide of the mark. And once again, we're just doing this in one dimension, so there's only one feature, x. And so each training example is a single number on the x-axis labeled with h prime of x plus some noise. Now, I'm going to use a learning algorithm that I'm initially going to motivate in a way that hopefully looks reasonable. In order to guess what h prime is, I'm going to pick a function h from a hypothesis space that minimizes um, this particular measure of error. Now this measure of error just takes each example, x i y i, it uses the function that I'm getting to choose, h, and comes up with a value of h of x i, and then it squares the difference between that and the actual value that I have in the training set. And finally, it sums up those quantities over 
all of the training examples. Now, I'm hoping that that seems a reasonable thing to do, because if each term in that sum is zero, then my h is predicting exactly the correct values for the y values in the training set. Also, each term in that summation increases as the difference between the prediction of my function h and the actual value y increases. And we're just adding up the terms for all the examples. So if big E is 0, then my h, the one that I'm using, predicts the labels in the training example exactly. And as it predicts them less well, the value of E increases. And I'm proposing that I choose the H that minimizes E. And that's my learning algorithm. Now just moving back briefly, the collection that I used as a basis for selecting the original unknown function h prime, in this case, is the collection of all polynomials of degree three. So I've used this particular degree three polynomial in order to generate my training data. But my hypothesis space in this case, the thing, the collection from which I'm selecting this unknown function h prime can be any degree three polynomial at all. So the first thing I'm going to illustrate here is what happens if I use the algorithm that I've just suggested, pick the h that minimizes the sum of the squared errors, and here I'm selecting my h from the same hypothesis space. Okay. I've selected the h that is a degree three polynomial and that minimizes the measure of error on the previous slide. Now I think it's fair to say that this h isn't doing too badly at all. Um, particularly if you take into account the fact that some of this data is quite a long way away from the dashed line that we're trying to identify. The solid line, which is the h that I've picked, is pretty close to the dashed line, which is h prime a function that we've never seen. If I was now given a new x to classify, say for example I was given this x value here, and this is a value of x that didn't appear in the training set, I would predict that its y value should be h of x. And I'd be fairly close to the correct value, which would be h prime of x. Wouldn't be spot on, but I'd be pretty close. But hopefully you can foresee the problem with this. In reality, I would not know what hypothesis space nature was using in the first place to take this function from, to take the function h prime from. So what if the one that I use doesn't match? Well, it's easy enough to explore what might happen. Let's now use the same learning algorithm and choose my h from the collection of all polynomials of degree at most five. And the underlying thought here is that because I don't actually know which h was being used, I'll make mine big in order to stand more of a chance of choosing something that's close to the unknown function h prime. And if I use the same algorithm again, I'm still doing quite well. Arguably, about as well as I did in the previous slide. If I had gone the other way, things might not have been so rosy. If, for example, I pick my function using the same training algorithm, but only allowing a polynomial of degree at most one, or in other words, a straight line, then unsurprisingly, the h that I get, which minimizes the sum of the squared errors between h's predictions and the actual y values in the training set, I get a straight line which clearly is not a good approximation to the dashed one. 
So, it seems at first glance that perhaps I want to just choose something from a really huge hypothesis space. Well, this is where we start to get into trouble. Here, I've chosen my H from a hypothesis space that is the set of all polynomials of degree at most 25. Now, this clearly includes within it the exact function that we're trying to identify, H prime, the dashed line, because that's a polynomial of degree 3. But the problem here is twofold. The first is that I've allowed my algorithm to choose a function that's potentially much more complicated than the one that I'm really trying to identify. Polynomials of degree up to 25, as you know, can have more stationary points than polynomials of degree up to only 3. That means essentially we can choose functions that are much more wobbly than the one we're after. And the second issue here is that there is noise in the data. So the noise in this case indicates that we may actually have an underlying function that has more than two stationary points. And our learning algorithm is now essentially trying to learn the noise because it's trying to find a function that will go exactly through the training points. Now, there are too many training points here for that to be possible. If I cranked up the degree sufficiently, then I could get myself a polynomial that goes exactly through each one of those training points and actually learns the noise perfectly, whereas what we want to learn is the underlying function. Now this is a fundamental problem in supervised learning. This is called overfitting. And you can think of it from two directions. Either you've got a hypothesis space that's too flexible, given the complexity and the quantity of training data, or you can think in terms of the quantity of training data just being too small to constrain the function you learned sufficiently to be a good approximation to the underlying structure of the data. Now that really is something um, to, to take on board at, right at the outset here because this interaction between the complexity of the space of functions you're choosing from and quantity of the training data that you have is absolutely critical in supervised learning. And decades of research and thousands of research papers have been published on trying to understand how the interaction between the quantity of training data and the complexity of the function space and the training algorithm that you use, and any number of other things that can have an influence on the training process, can affect the quality of generalization that you end up with. Because remember, it's generalization that is the absolute key thing that we're trying to achieve when we do supervised learning. Now, in particular, in this example, we have areas, for example, here and here and here, where generalization is not going to be good because the prediction made by the solid line is a good way away from the correct value, which is the prediction made by the dashed line. Now that, if you like, gives you a good chunk of the big picture of what we're trying to achieve. But now we're going to focus on something much more specific. Obviously, in practice, we're going to deal with more than a single dimension. We're not just going to have a single feature, x, but we're going to have n features. So we're therefore trying to do this kind of curve fitting, but in an n-dimensional space. And the simplest possible way, really, in which you can achieve this, is to use a linear discriminant. Now, for historical reasons, these are also called perceptrons, but really all they do is compute a linear function and then pass it through something that usually looks a bit like a step function and that generally has the name activation function. Now these things, 
have been known in statistics for many, many decades, um, and they were introduced into computer science partly um, when people first got interested in neural networks. And they were introduced in that context largely because experiments on spinal neurons, which are nowhere near as complicated as uh, the really interesting neurons in your brain, the experiments showed that you could get an initial model of these spinal neurons by treating them uh, as essentially taking a weighted sum of the signals that were coming into them and then either firing if that weighted sum was over some threshold and not firing otherwise. So initially an awful lot of work on perceptrons used um, an activation function that was just a step function. So we would have the x-axis here and sigma x would be on the y-axis and sigma x would be 0 if x was less than or equal to 0 and 1 if x was greater than 0. And a huge quantity of the early research on perceptrons was done using that activation function. Currently it's much less common when identified specifically with neural networks because we use a version that looks like a smoothed off kind of step function and I'll come on to that in a moment. But the step function is still used in the context of support vector machines which are a current state-of-the-art machine learning method and uh, there, are, there are reasons for that which I'll talk about in the, uh, the course the next year. But ultimately these things are so ubiquitous in machine learning that if you really understand a perceptron well, you're a good way to understanding what happens in a neural network more generally when you put a whole bunch of these things together or where you mix them together with, with functions that do different but still pretty closely related things. Now I'll just say a little bit more about that activation function. Quite often for regression problems uh, you don't need it at all. Now in that case all you're doing is the equivalent of fitting a linear function to some data in one dimension if uh, you use this purely linear activation function then you'd just be fitting a line through your data. In two dimensions it becomes a plane and in n dimensions it becomes a multi-dimensional plane. Um, and for a sufficiently simple regression problem that may be all you need. But we're really going in the direction here of um, combining a whole bunch of these things together. For two class classification problems you can use a step function which indicates one class if the argument of the activation function is greater than zero or the other class otherwise. And that's how they were used historically in the context of neural networks and how they are still used um, when dealing with support vector machines. In a lot of what follows and in a lot of what currently happens and has happened for the last few decades with neural networks, um, one uses a sigmoid or logistic activation function and that looks like a smoothed off version of a step function. So for this guy what happens when uh, z goes to minus infinity or when z goes down to minus infinity uh, e to the minus z gets huge and this expression goes to zero. So if this is z and this is sigma z then down here it's, it's at zero. If um, z gets huge then e to the minus z goes to zero and the expression here converges to one so when z is huge this is up around one and in between you will find that it smoothly ramps up, it's symmetric and it passes through here at a half. And for more recent work um, one often uses uh, an activation function that has many of the pros of a sigmoidal logistic function but is uh, easier to compute in numerical terms.
And here I've just illustrated what the logistic function looks like, okay, without, without hand drawing it. So this is a, a bit more accurate. And the key um, thing that we need here moving forward when we get into neural networks is that that logistic function is differentiable, whereas the step function isn't. On the right, I've shown what happens when you put the logistic function onto the output of a linear sum in two dimensions. So what I have here is precisely the expression for a perceptron. In the case that n equals 2, so we're just computing a linear function in two dimensions and then applying the sigmoid function to it. Right, hopefully you can imagine that there is a straight line in the x1, x2 plane and that on one side of that line the logistic function gives an output greater than a half and on the other side of the line the logistic function gives an output of less than a half and so that straight line gives you the boundary between where you would classify a two-featured input as being in class one or as in class two. Now I'll give just a heads up here which is that we're going to need to deal quite a lot with linear functions of this kind, that is essentially perceptrons with either a step or a sigmoid activation function. And as a result, it helps rather a lot to understand, just going back briefly again, how the form of this function, h of the weight vector w and the input vector x, depends on the weights that we choose, the w values. There is a very straightforward way in which you can visualize what this function looks like, depending on how you choose the weights. And the problem sheet for this part of the course starts with a sequence of exercises that asks you to derive uh, what's needed in order to come up with that way of visualizing what's going on. So at this point, I strongly suggest that you actually do that part of the problem sheet. So, to get this started, um, let's imagine that we're using one of these basic perceptrons in order to try and learn some training data, and that we're going to do it using exactly the same approach as we did in the initial example, trying to visualize this as just curve fitting in one dimension, where we minimize um, a measure of error that is the sum of the squared differences between what's in the training data and the predictions of the function that we choose. And we're going to do this now for a perceptron in general, and we're going to do it initially just for the easy case, which is where the activation function is linear. In that case, we have this measure of error, e of w, which is exactly as it was before. And because the perceptron is defined by the values of its weights, this error is now a function of the weight vector. What we have now plugged in here is a perceptron. Now we're going to modify the notation slightly. Um, if you look again back at the equation for the perceptron, you see that uh, there's kind of um, a special term here. This, this w naught, which is sometimes called the bias term, is out on its own because it's not associated with an x. Now, we don't necessarily want to have a, something that looks special um, in this sense, okay? It would be much nicer if we just had a simple expression in here rather than this bias term plus something that's kind of nice and uniform. So what we can do now is add uh, an extra feature that's always one. And that corresponds to the bias weight. And then instead of writing the perceptron um, out as uh, a sum, we can just replace it with an inner product because if I write w transpose x, then that's actually w naught Okay, times one, because inner products take the sum of the products of corresponding pairs, and that gives me plus 
W1, X1, plus dot dot dot, plus WN, XN. So the perceptron that we had here can actually just be written as an inner product here. So what we have now is this expression for the error as a function of W, and it's actually the same as the one we used earlier. We've now just got a perceptron plugged into it. Now, what we want to do is minimize this function big E of W. And if you cast your mind back to much earlier on in the course, when I talked about local search, one of the things that I talked about was how to solve precisely this kind of problem. So, if necessary, at this point, go back and look again at that part of the lecture notes and refresh your memory with the fact that if I want to minimize some function, in this case e of w, I can do it iteratively by starting with some randomly chosen point I'll call w at time naught, and then updating that such that to get from the w at time t to the w one step later, I just move in a small step. It goes downhill in the sense that it decreases the value of e of w, and in order to do that I evaluate the gradient of e of w at my current point, w at time t, and I subtract a small step that goes in that direction. Now in order to get gradient of e of w, I merely have to differentiate its expression with respect to each of the weights individually, and I hope that you can see that that is just a straightforward application of gradient descent as I introduced it earlier in the course. The only thing that we have to do in order to apply that algorithm, in order to train a perceptron, is find ourselves an expression for the derivative of e of w with respect to w. Now you may have noticed that for this specific example, it's, a, it's possible to analytically and directly find the w that minimizes e of w without resorting to this kind of iterative process. But I'm going to demonstrate how to do it this way, using gradient descent, specifically as a stepping stone to the more general case of doing precisely the same thing for a neural network. So, all we actually have to do here is to evaluate the gradient of E of W by evaluating the derivatives of E of W with respect to the individual weights. Now this is straightforward because the expression for E of W is this expression here. And well, we'll do this uh, in about the smallest steps that I can come up with. If we wish to differentiate e of w with respect to some weight wj, then here we've just put d by dwj in front of the expression for e of w. And then because we can swap derivatives with summation signs, we've moved this guy inside the sum in order to get this expression. And then because I have a function of a function that I'm differentiating here, because we have this square, we do the usual process for differentiating a function of a function. Now, the derivative of, let's say, z squared is 2z. So in order to take the derivative of y minus w transpose xi squared, we get 2 times that, and then we need to differentiate y minus w transpose xi 
y doesn't depend in any way on the jth weight, so it disappears, and we're just left with this term. And finally, if I expand out the expression w transpose x i, well, this x i is the i th thing in the training set, so it is a vector. And this, if I expand it out, looks like w naught times 1 plus w1 times, okay, well it will be x i vector, but we want the first element, plus dot 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 plus wj times j element of the i vector, plus dot 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 plus wn times the nth vector. And here, once again, we're differentiating with respect to wj, the jth weight, and the only term in that sum that actually has wj in it is this one. So the rest of these guys are all zero, and we found that d by dwj of w transpose xi is just the jth element of xi. So we've taken the, uh, the negative out outside the sum, and this whole term has essentially collapsed into that. So that gives us an expression for the derivative of E of W with respect to an arbitrary weight, namely Wj, the jth weight. Now just going back a slide, remember that we're doing that for all of the weights to get a new vector, and it's that that we're using to take little steps, each of which reduces the value of e. Now when we collect each of these individual derivatives together into one vector in order to get d e of w by d, the whole vector, w, just notice that the, uh, the factor of minus 2 and also this guy here are the same for each element, okay, regardless of which j we're using. And that means that the only things that differ across those individual values, those individual derivatives with respect to wj, are these terms. And there's one for each j. So actually what we end up with there is just the original vector xi back. You may want to write that out in full. And that means that our, our equation now for iteratively updating the weight vector in such a way that at each iteration the value of e of w gets smaller looks like this, where we've collected the individual values for the jth value of x i into this term here. Now in this case, e of w is actually parabolic, so it's got a unique global minimum and no local minima. So this works actually pretty well, and that's also the reason that you can do this analytically, um, which in practice one probably would. Well, again, I'll emphasize here that I'm going through this process in order to illustrate it with the aim of going on next to more complicated networks. And also, for those of you who studied this kind of thing, uh, yes, I'm aware that uh, there are conditions under which this is non-parabolic, but that's essentially a side case and it doesn't complicate matters for us. And finally, and before I go on to um, something more complex, I'll just point out that this is a general method and our e of w doesn't have to look like this. 
there are there are measures of error on the training set that look different to the sum of squared errors. And in fact, uh, in the problem sheet, this is explored in some detail. So we can apply the same method to other measures of error. And we can apply it if we have more complex activation functions, not just the linear one. And we end up with a different expression, but this is something that we can still do in practice.